Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome back to the E4U virtual talk series. I'm your host, Jaleesha Bass, and I am a digital docent with E4U. Uh, Just a little bit about me is that I am a fourth year double major at the University of Texas in Austin with a major in journalism and communication and leadership. Um, Today's virtual talks are mainly about making sure that you know um, about what's happening in the creative industry right now and sort of introducing you guys to different creative leaders and different just creative professionals in the industry while they sort of tell their story and let you know about what they're doing um, in the different spaces. So our speaker today is Shiana. Uh, Shiana has 20 plus years of experience with audio recording, ADR editing, Foley, and all things audio. She has extensive entertainment industry experience, including audio production for TV, radio commercials, Academy Award winning feature films, major studio recording releases, and nationally synthesized radio broadcasts. And some of the projects that she's worked on include Parks and Recreation, CSI, and Cubo, which is like super awesome. So welcome Cheyenne Brown to the screen. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm doing great, it's good to see you today. Good to see you too. Uh, So just to start off, can you just tell everybody like what do you do? What's the company you work for? You know, what is your role? So I'm basically an audio engineer, but I do post-production sound for TV shows and movies. And I have a company that specializes in that. We also do sound for podcasts and commercials and pretty much any sound thing that you need that's not music. We don't record music at my place. We will edit music though and mix it. So even that. Okay, okay, that's awesome. Okay. Okay, okay. And I mean, can we get like some examples of the work that um, that you're doing? Looks like some's coming up. Yeah, can you sort of explain to us what it is uh, before we start it? So we, we would have actors from any of these TV shows come into our studio and any dialogue that was filmed that doesn't sound right to whoever the sound producer is on the show, mm-hmm. we, we re-record. So 
um, what did, you know, you mentioned CSI maybe was one of the TV shows. So an actor from that show would come in, we would have the video mm -hmm. and we get a script of all of the lines in that episode that have something wrong with them. And it could be that a plane flew overhead while they were shooting it, or mm -hmm. that maybe they stumbled on part of it, or maybe the network said, hey, this this scene isn't clear. Can you add this line to, to the scene? And so maybe the shots on the actor's back and so they can say something that we can add dialogue in that way. And so they come into the studio and we play video for them and they match their lips or if it's on their back, they just match their tone and mm -hmm. that's it. On a T, okay, okay, okay. Well, let's see what you got working with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They just can't get my nose right. So, uh, back home, you're, you're hunters? We were hunters. Family business. But our world's probably gone. We made it out just before the explosion. God. God? Yeah. You're gonna need another beer. How can we stay, Dad? Man, Detroit, son. Lion don't leave the Serengeti. And besides, it's gonna be our year after the killing. You realize you're the worst father ever. I'm not gonna let you ruin your life, Don. No drugs in the house. <laughs> Everything's fine. Not fine. You're fine, Ma. Fine, Don. You. You're fine. I'm not gonna let her talk to you. I'm going to the goddamn Shut house. Ray, stay out of it. Put some clothes on, will ya? We're going for custard. What? You work with the UT legend Matthew McConaughey? Yes, he's been in a lot. Hey. Yeah. Dang, well, that's really cool. I didn't even know that, like, people had to, like, I don't know. I just, I didn't under, I don't think I really fully realized to, like, that certain extent, like, how much, like, post-production work has to be done. Like, I literally yeah. thought, like, the actors just acted and then. And that's it. People just cut it. Right. Well, and it depends on the director and the sound supervisor. It t depends on a lot of people mm -hmm. how much work goes into the post-production of sound. Um, mm -hmm. But for instance, in that Matthew McConaughey clip that we just saw, it, he leans down and says, it's fine. And then he stands back and you see his face and he says, this is all fine. And he says other things, but that original it's fine wasn't in there. So he came into the studio and recorded mm -hmm. just that line that got plopped in to help tell the story a little better, a little more clearly. So it's, you know, it's all magic done behind the scenes that helps the story come alive and sound better. If the sound's off, you'll feel it and it won't, it won't be as good of a production and you won't be able to buy into the story and be taken away by the storytelling if there's something off of the sound. So it's a good thing to fix. I mean, well, how did you get into the creative industry? I was homeschooled to become a musician. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of years at home playing music and my dad had recording studio technology just when it was just starting and pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time in his, it was in our laundry room. So I spent a lot of time in our laundry room, just playing around, recording myself, recording friends mm -hmm. and got to know the software that way. And then when I started college, it, counted as a science. So it seemed a little bit easier to do something I was already familiar with than to learn anatomy and physiology or something like that. So I took a bunch of classes when I was in college and really did the digital audio space was just starting to take off when I was in, in college. So mm -hmm. I was part of this first wave of learning how to manipulate sound in computers and mm -hmm. it took off from there. Well, and you went to college when you were 16. I feel like that's crazy. Like, I don't know, do you have like, I don't know, like was that your decision or like? Yeah, so I, as I said, I was homeschooled and I finished the curriculum that we had for high school. It uh -huh. it wasn't home, it was more no school. It was just here, go work through this math workbook, read this book, um, and it was all self-paced. So I just finished math stuff 
And right, it was actually right before I turned 16, I, my parents said I could either go to college or something else. And UT has a thing where high school students can co-enroll for free. So mm-hmm. it's like, I'll just do that. That seems easy. Let's do that. Well, you went to college rent free? Well, I went to, I think my first two years were free. Yeah. What? That's I know. A- it's a loophole. I was, I, cause I was a co-enrolled high school student. What? It was also a lot less expensive back then anyway, but yeah, it was free. I could only take two classes a semester for free, but still, you know. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, like, how did you figure out like music? I mean, not music, like audio production stuff, like was your passion or was it something that was like directly affected by like your dad? Uh, So I thought, I thought I wanted to go into music production and engineering because of my dad and because it was so familiar and it seemed like a place where I could help, I could be in the creative field. I could help with the creative process, but I didn't have to be on stage, which I really didn't like. We had a family band when I was homeschooled also, and we had to perform and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. So this was a way to be behind the scenes, but also still part of this process that I I really loved and was familiar with. And then I am pretty spastic and I move quickly and I really like I like kind of complex problems. And so I had a director came to town and needed someone who knew the software. And Mm. so I got hooked up with him and started working for him and learned this process of what's called ADR, the dialogue replacement in TV shows and movies. And Mm. it just fit my passions. It was really fun. It felt like a video game, trying to match everything together and Mm -hmm. juggle everything. And so it just, it took off. It felt right. It was a really good fit. But I didn't know it existed before I ended up taking the job. That's he. That's crazy. I mean, also, like, who was your dad? Uh, his name is Danny. Danny Levin. He was in a country band when I was born called Asleep at the Wheel that is still going on today. But he he left when I was born, um, and now he plays in with um, let's see with Bob Schneider. I mean, not now because no one's doing anything right now, but. Yeah. Before all of the pit, he was playing with Bob Schneider once a week at Saxon Pub and with uh, Dale Watson, uh, Shiny Ribs. He, he plays with everyone. I'd be like that sometimes. And what, yeah. what instrument did you play in the family band? I didn't know that. Just piano, the boring piano. Why piano gotta be boring? Well, my little sister plays harp. And so people would like run past me to get to her and this magnificent, literally gold crusted or crested <laughs> instrument. So she, you know, she was the perfect angel playing the harp and I was with boring piano. Man, that's crazy. I'm sorry. I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know. I feel like a lot of people can relate to that too, you know, sort of like being surpassed for the, quote unquote better child. <laughs> yeah. I, I can understand why you call it boring now. Yeah. For sure, for sure. I mean, like, did you have like any mentors or any like really key experiences um that help you in like achieving your goals in the field? I had people, I mean, you know, no one no one takes this journey alone. No, mm-hmm. you know, no matter what, you will have people around you and you can take from every experience, good or bad, learning from every experience. There have been key people throughout my journey who have stuck with me and just supported me no matter what. One of one of my, you know, he's he's kind of a best friend, mentor. I've known him as long as I've been an engineer, you know, since my college days. And even he, I don't think he thought my business was going to be a success, but he supported me trying it. It's like you know, I don't think there's a market for this, but. You, you go see, you you do what you need to do. And so I think he's probably my only men- mentor in the traditional sense of someone I'd go to when I have problems to run them by him and just a cheerleader. But there have been others, you know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's very like important, I feel like, to have like people to help you. Um, yeah. Way. And can you tell us about, you know, any like examples of any obstacles you faced along the way um, when climbing your way through the industry, so how you overcame those things? I'm I'm not sure I've overcome them, oh. but um, 
it just definitely being a girl, you know, audio engineers are not chicks. So, so that's, it's, it's really hard to be taken seriously um, as a woman, but also, you know, I started really young. I was, I was very young. And so young people aren't immediately respected or, or really deferred to or trusted. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. overcoming that. Um, and I still deal with self-doubt, insecurity, anxiety, those, those things that would, mm -hmm. you know, they, they hold me back and, Right. Just the, the kind of internal fear. Faith, mm -hmm. And it could be with something as simple as, okay, I have a big session and I'm nervous about this director, or it mm -hmm. could be, okay, I want to offer this product at my company, but I don't feel confident enough that I could do it. What, whatever it is, fear is always there. So right. I think, I think recognizing it is an important first step uh, to overcoming it, or at least coexisting with it. Maybe I'm not sure any of my demons are gone, but I can recognize them and sit with it and be like, oh, this is that feeling in my stomach that I get before a big job. And mm -hmm. that's okay. Let's ride with this and I threw it and keep doing the jobs and not let the fear keep me at home or keep me from jumping into a project that could be good. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for like young girls who are like jumping into this industry that you wish you would have known when you first jumped in? I think knowing that there, that you bring something of value, that you, mm -hmm. y your value there can be more than just you're a token girl or I, I don't know, the, the self-questioning and then the lack of self-worth I think has been a problem for me my whole adult life. And I wish going back, I could just shake myself and say, you know, none of that matters. You're human, no more, no less. Just go in there and do your best. Bring it, bring it, like bring all of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one thing that being homeschooled allowed me was mm -hmm. the comfort of keeping my weirdnesses. You know, I think mm -hmm. public schools maybe would have beaten some of that out of me and taught me how to conform a little better. And mm -hmm. instead, I'm just really weird in a lot of, you know, I, I have, I do it neatly in a box. And I think it's, it's really nice to, um, all of the complex and maybe contradictory parts of yourself and bring that to your job, to your work, to your passion, to everything you do. Mm -hmm. I wish that I'd known that instead of, I look back and think of the times that, you know, I'd go to a session and everyone would be wearing torn jeans and I would not be. So the next day I would show up in torn jeans. It's like, no, no, I need to just be whoever I am. That means. Mm. No, I definitely feel that. You say that louder for the people in the back. <laughs> yeah, be all that you are, and all that you are is is wonderful. It's when you start trying to conform to what society wants of you or what other people want of you, and the better you get at that, the more difficult it is for you to live your full self because suddenly all of these people are expecting you to be this this creature that you've created to fit what you think their expectations and desires are. And then the doors start opening for you being that contorted person, that creation instead of the real you. And if you're the real you and you keep showing up fully as the real you unapologetic, just, you know, this is me. This is, these are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. This is my fear. This is what I can do for you. This is what I'm hoping that you can do for me. You show up in that way. Then the doors that open are really good fits. Dang, you you're loud. I'm very loud. <laughs> I mean, not like you're like physically loud, but what you're saying is like truth. Like you know yeah. what I mean. I mean it's it's something that I tell myself every day. I tell my son every day. Like mm -hmm. yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I've shown you to hear that. I struggle with that too a lot of times. Like whenever I'm like doing work and I'll like you know come into like our work meetings and I'll complain to Carl and I'll be like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not that creative. I don't feel like I can do this anymore. And he'll be like, no, like you got this. Like you're perfect. Like it's fine. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like there is this myth in our culture, in our society that you reach a point and whether it's, okay, you, you graduate from college or maybe it's you get this job or maybe it's you've been in the field five years. And at some point, something like magically, you now know. 
you have the answer, you know the truth, you are what, and that's effort, that's not true. We're all always constantly learning and evolving and questioning and not knowing and having the anxiety and fear of not knowing and having to move forward with that discomfort. If you think you know it, you're like, ah, I got this, I know it, whatever. <laughs> I feel like you're probably missing some very key things about life in general. Right. And do you ever feel like imposter syndrome whenever you're like in the industry? Totally. Every day, all the time, all the time. And so part of the, you know, being a girl in this industry and having people walk in, I mean, I've been doing this for like 20 years, something, I don't know. I don't know. A long, long time. And I still have people, oh, wow, the sun just, did you, can you see the light just happened? It's like, oh, the sun's coming up. Um, but people come into my studio and they see a girl and they discount me and then they'll go to people who you know guys who work for me or work with me and oh, all, like all the time and to this day or on the phone people will say um you know i need to talk to your engineer I'm like no no i'm my engineer you talk to me and they're like no no you know and every time something like that happens i take it as proof that i'm an imposter this, they must be right. They know something that I don't know. Clearly, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, so that's also a daily fight. And I think everyone has that to some extent. No, that's actually crazy. I, I don't even, not like, um, not like I don't know, but like, it's just how, like, you still like work with people, even though like they are like clearly misogynistic, you know? Well, I am very lucky now that I'm in a place where I can step away. If mm -hmm. if I get in a situation with somebody who is misogynistic or even just disrespectful, mm -hmm. I, I can say, you know, peace out. I'm done for the day and walk away. But that hasn't always been the case. You know, mm -hmm. I worked for people until eight or nine years ago when I, whenever I started my business eight and a half years ago, I worked for other people. And so I would have to work with plenty of people who looked at me and didn't think that I could be a competent engineer. Mm -hmm. But yes, now I do get to walk away. <laughs> I just be like, you know what? I'm going to put you with a different engineer. So we're done for now. And I would love that for you. Because honestly, you've been doing this for as long as I've been alive, honestly. Like, <laughs> been oh, gosh. 20 plus years. That's, that's, that's before I even popped up in the womb. Yeah. yeah. So for people to just like discredit your work and be like, oh, we don't know about her. Like, I'm like, huh? Like, do you not know who this lady is? Like, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. But I guess. Um, and how did you and so you talked about how you used to work for other people? How did you transition, you know, from like working as a creative into you know having your own company? Well, so I had a baby and it's really difficult to keep a professional career going at the same speed when you are also caring for a tiny infant and nursing. And even so I, I was, I've always been freelance, always a contractor, um, mm -hmm. contractor engineer, and I would work for people and they, they're even the kindest person can't, it, it's not their fault that they need an engineer to be on the board for eight hours straight. But when you're a nursing mom, you have to go pump. You have to go take care of your kid or what, whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. so it was very difficult to, to keep work enough to support myself and my kiddo. I had gotten divorced like maybe a year before I started my business or two years. Mm -hmm. And it was really just looking at the numbers and realizing that if I could keep enough business just to keep myself afloat, I could do it with far fewer hours than working for other people. And... I would be able to take care of my son in the way that I wanted to and prioritize him and take jobs or, or not depending on his needs and, and my needs to be with him. So mm -hmm. it was necessity. I was, and, and a lot of people didn't think it would be a lot of people in my surrounding did not mm -hmm. have the most faith in it working out, mm -hmm. but uh, I maxed out through two or three credit cards and bought gear and that's it. It was just a, a leap of faith and hope. Period. You do you, sis. I, I, I don't know. Like, how do you, how do you even like deal with that when people are telling you like things are like not gonna work out or things are gonna fail? Like, how do you like push back past those comments? Like, like me personally, that would get to me, and I'll be like, "Dang, you're right. I'm a failure. Let me not do this." 
Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it got to the point where I just had to, because I, I couldn't keep trying to take jobs that required me to be away from my kid all the time. I couldn't commit to a week long project or a two week long project. So I didn't feel like I had a choice, but to do this, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is very hard not to take the naysayers to heart and to feel like they must know something that I don't know. They must be seeing something that I am missing. But I think that's really, it's an important part of the journey is believing in yourself and in the idea and continuing on. I mean, you have four kids now. How do you work with like your work life balance? Like, what does that look like? (laughs) So it's, it's a little crazy. So I actually, I have four step kids and then I have one kid that I made. So it's five, five kids total, but two of them are in college. One's at UT. Um, So those two, you know, it's just a pleasure anytime I get to interact with them, which is seldom. Oh my gosh, my dog's going crazy in the background. <laughs> um, and then the, so I have two younger step kids and they're, they're only with us every other weekend. And then maybe three weeks a year, you know, in the summers and stuff, we get them for longer. And then my kiddo is primarily with me. And I mean, especially with the COVID shutdown, it is it's crazy. It's just constant and crazy. And right. I'm, I'm really lucky that I can do sessions remotely. We have technology now that allows us to hook up. I can hook up here at my house to a studio in LA or New York or yesterday, Washington, DC and record people with broadcast quality. And I can patch in clients so they can zoom and listen in. And it's all, I'm lucky that all of that is working, but while I'm doing that, I'm also, looking at my kiddo, like, okay, have you done your algebra? Okay. Have you worked in your writing journal? Like, mm-hmm. you know, trying to keep on that. And, and meanwhile, t- you know, texting my husband, did you order groceries for dinner? And it's just, it's a lot of dominoes setting up a lot of dominoes. Um, I, I'm not great at it, at it. There's not, I don't do a lot of self care. There's no, like I should have a yoga routine. I don't <laughs> all of that. I do eat ice cream every day, but I don't think that's the self care that I should be proud of. It's I'm vegan, but vegan ice cream every night. It's just a little self care. I won't knock you. I mean, you're doing your thing out here, so I just feel like it is what it is. So it is what it is. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, so you work for this company. You have this team. Um, Like, what does your like team workflow look like? so I have a studio manager and he's just kind of the magical glue that keeps everyone together. Mm-hmm. He he knows who's coming in and out. He keeps mm-hmm. track of snacks in the kitchen. Back when we were allowed to share food now, you know, with COVID, everything's very different. But he he's just at the studio keeping track of all the goings on and making sure everything's smooth and, and working. And then mm-hmm. I have, so I have a, a, a team of, six freelance engineers, contract engineers who come in and work on projects when they fit their specialty or interests. And then I have a a full-time engineer who's just, I I don't, he loves, he loves this world. He doesn't seem to go home very much. I don't know if he sleeps at the studio. Anytime I text him, he's like, well, I'm at the studio. What do you need? Maybe you should go home. It's the weekend or it's nine o'clock at night, man. But he, you know, he he's there all the time prepping sessions and and runs a lot of them and since covid hit he we decided he would man all st- all sessions at the studio mm-hmm. and which is actually right by UT and i would handle all remote sessions from my home studio so mm-hmm. that's the flow right now and you know anytime because we all have home studios anytime a project comes in i can delegate it to whichever engineer is most appropriate for the job and it's a little weird not being all in the same space, that's mm-hmm. taken some time too. Um, there are good things and bad things. I mean, I had a client text me last night at 9.30 and I was able to just, you know, hop up here and make some edits and and that's nice. We love to see you. That's okay, okay, okay. And so, you know, like, so you talked about like um, not having I mean, not having, not having, oh, not being able to like be in the studio um, because of COVID nineteen. How else has like COVID nineteen sort of affected like your workspace or like the amount of clients? 
Well, so our, my main clientele is TV shows and movies. And of course, all production is shut down. Or it, it did shut down in March. Slowly, mm -hmm. I'm seeing a return. And, and they're, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what day is it? Thir Thursday, 1.30. There's a session in there right now doing ADR for a TV show. So they're, they're working on post-production. I think there is a push to get things back on screens. So it's coming back. But we have new protocol in place. Everyone to come in has to wear a mask. Um, I have two people at the studio who just wipe down things every hour, handles, door handles, bathroom. We send out a list and we ask all talent to bring their own scripts. So there's no handing back and forth of materials. We ask them to bring their own drinks, whereas we used to have a fully stocked kitchen and snacks. So that's changed. Also, we don't let anyone come in to watch the sessions or direct. That all has to be done remotely. And so we use Zoom or Skype or just a phone and they can call and be patched into the studio. So all of that is new. Yeah, I'm glad, man. It's new for me. That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, okay, okay. How did things like work before then? Um, so before COVID hit. Before COVID hit, we would have more people in studio. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could have three to five talent in the booth at one time and then a team of... Um, I think we'd have, we could have a producer, a couple writers. We could have, I'm trying to think of who else would be there, maybe account supervisors or account director, people who would work with the client and make sure the client was getting what they wanted. And then sometimes the client, like um, I just did yesterday, I did some radio for Capital Metro. So we would have had pre COVID, all of us would have been in the studio two voice talent, me, another engineer producer, two writers, a creative, and then four people from Capital Metro to make sure, you know, so all we would all be in the studio. <laughs> I know, it's a lot of people, but we'd all be in the studio making a script come to life and getting ready for something to hit the air. And now post COVID that all has to happen remotely. I mean, can you, give us, can you describe to us like, what like does a session look like when people come into your space? So it depend, depends on what it is, but we can just use yesterday's radio is an example. So usually it starts with breakfast tacos. I think that's very important, very important start to the day. Yay. So we get the breakfast tacos and the people, so the ad agency people come in mm -hmm. and that's a producer, writer of the script, mm -hmm. maybe um, art director of its TV or mm -hmm. you know, various people from the agency, maybe three to five people. And then also, they might bring in some of their clients. So people who actually work at Capital Metro who hired this agency to create a radio campaign would come in also. And they're there to say things like, oh, legally, we can't say this line or, oh, this is actually our th this is what we have started saying. So we want to keep this line in here, but let's edit this out of the script or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then and then the voice talent. And it depends on what the script calls for, but one to ten voice talent per script. And usually me and then one other engineer is backup. Mm -hmm. And, you know, first talent goes in, we record, uh, let's, whatever, we record 10 or 20 or 30 of li each line on the script. Mm -hmm. And then edit, usually add some music, maybe add some sound effects, whatever the spot calls for. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's just a radio job. It's, di it's a different process for the TV and movie stuff. Mm -hmm. that, that stuff we usually connect to studios in LA and mainly LA or New York. Um, mm -hmm. And all of this is done with a software called Pro Tools, which is the thing that came out when I was in college and is now much more affordable. I think it got really expensive and now it's a little more affordable, but it's mm -hmm. the industry standard. And so all the studios that do this have Pro Tools and we have other software that allows the two computers to sync up. So when I hit play on my computer, mm -hmm. this the other studio's computer starts to play. So it, I know it's really cool. It's really cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, then do y'all, do y'all hire interns or? <laughs> so I, I teach at Texas state and, um, I try to let my students intern. And one of the requirements for them to graduate from the program is 300 hour intern hours, which seems like a ton. Uh, but I understand why it's really, it's really important to have, to see the real world use of 
the sound recording technology. So mm -hmm. they have to have 300 hours. So I try to let them come in. I'm usually backed up two to three years with interns. Mm -hmm. but, but yes, I do. I mean, so, how did you get involved with working for Texas State? I think four years. I think four years. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. And four. before, four, just four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And before that, I, I'm a friend of mine teaches a Pro Tools class at UT. And mm -hmm. usually he asks me, he has me come talk for a class each semester, which is also really nice. I love seeing the young people, you know, I love seeing you guys in college because y'all are the movers and shakers and you're, you know, you are the future. So it's, right. I, love, I love getting to see, see y'all. What class do you teach and how did you get started with teaching? I don't know the name of it. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I don't know the name of it. It's maybe it's called post production. That would be, it has some long number. It's in the, mu it's in the music school at Texas State and. Mm -hmm. It's it's about all of this. We talk about audiobook recording, podcasts, ADR, commercials, mm -hmm. um, TV mixing. All, all of that is what's covered. So I, I, if it's not called post production, it should be called post production. Right. Yeah. And like, what do you do to like get your students prepared for entering the industry? We do. I run mock sessions with them where you know, I'll grab a pen and paper. I keep the script for myself and I sit in the back of the room and I say, oh, I want to hear three takes. So I, pretend, I we, we pretend the whole semester is just fun yep. pretending that we're doing sessions. And mm -hmm. I try to stay hands off the computer and make them jump in and do all of the work so they get real hands-on experience. And mm -hmm. you know, I like to say things like, all right, all right, if this, you know, keep going, I, I want take five on this line. Okay, take mm -hmm. seven, you know, this is too slow. I don't think I'd use the studio again. So, you know, just, different things like that to play with them and and get them ready for what is really high pressure and intense work when you're in the studio and you've got a bunch of people there saying you know different feedback and mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for young people who are just graduating whether it's from like high school or college you know going into the industry and how they can sort of like break in with experience what i did is just, I played, I did any, any spare time I had, you know, I, I had to work through college, so I didn't have a lot of spare time, but <laughs> any downtime, it's like, Hey, I've got a friend come over. Let me record you even no matter what I had to use. You know, I didn't have pro tools at home, but mm -hmm. I had access to studio sometimes with pro tools. And it's I think all on Mac or PC, both mm -hmm. originally Mac. Mm -hmm. Um, I use it on a Mac. Mm -hmm. But but they have it for both. Mm -hmm. um, and fun, so I, the first class I ever taught on Pro Tools was on a PC, which I had never used with Pro Tools. So I kept trying to do quick commands and weird things would happen. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I, I quit. Um, but yeah, I think getting in there and having your own projects and collaborating with anyone you can, I think you could also, especially at a place like UT, you could go talk to the film department and say, hey, I want to do this stuff. Do you have any student creating films that need sound help? And, and you know, collaborate with people who are in similar but different areas who might need audio help. But just get in there and do it. Yeah, and a lot of students who, you know, work for E4 um, are students of color, you know? So, like, is there anything that, like, your company in particular is doing to make sure that people of color feel safe in that space or...? That I mean, it's. I think that's a wonderful question, and it's so important, and it's really hard in my space um, mm. because it's mostly white dudes. Like all of them are white dudes. Every all the interns I get, white dudes, white dudes, and nothing wrong with white dudes. I love some white dudes, but it is really hard. Somebody recently asked me how many women I employ. I was like, can you find me a woman? I would love to employ a woman, but it's. Hard hard. Um, mm -hmm. So to answer your question, I mean, actors are different, right? I get actors who are all over the place with right. um, you know, they, all, all different kinds of people come in. And so to make them feel safe, I mean, I think they know it's a, it's a safe space and 
I will take care of them and be their ally in any way that is ne necessary, needed at all. But ho hopefully it's just, no, you're a professional, I'm a professional, come on in. Um, one thing that I do for a di diversity of projects and mm -hmm. collaboration is, um, for instance, you know, if someone emailed and said, hey, I've got a film and I need sound work, what's, what do you charge? I charge this amount, it's very much, here's my budget. If you wrote me and said, you know, if you have a sliding scale, um, this is a, I'm doing a short on diversity in Austin or something like that, I'd say, okay, absolutely. What can you afford? We'll work with you completely. I don't care about the money. I just would love to be part of your project. And so in that way, we try to make the studio more accessible to people with maybe fewer resources. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's it. Okay, okay, understandable. Yeah. Um, and just so y'all know, we are about to enter the Q&A part of the session. So if you guys have any questions, uh, make sure that you put them in the chat and we'll start answering them. Um, and while you guys are thinking of your questions or writing them down, um, I have another question for you. And it's just like, what is the favorite part of your job? You know, like what, like, or what is the favorite job you've ever done, you know? Oh, gosh. Um, that is a good question. I, I love, I mean, I love my work because every day is different. I never know what the actor is going to be like, what the sound team on the other side is going to be like. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what, you know, all, all of it, what's going to be required in, in the session. I meet amazing people. I meet some jerks, mm -hmm. uh, but no, no two sessions are ever the same. So it's not like I go in and it's like, ah, another, another day of this it's always different and so I love that about it um there's a guy who lives in Austin he's a reporter Dan, his name's Dan Rather I don't know if you yes I guess I've heard so much about this man so he, he's he lives in Austin half the time and he's brilliant he's just he's incredibly well informed he's been all over the world in every kind of situation he's talked to all sorts of people and so i love sessions with him because we'll do you know we'll record and then we just sit and talk for a couple hours and it's fascinating and you know it's he's amazing and kind and thoughtful and so those are my favorite kinds of sessions with interesting kind of people man that's so awesome the only thing I can tell you about Darren Rather is that he cried. I don't know. At one point in college, listen, I don't, we had an assignment for journalism, and I don't know what it was. And I remember one night we were all like up tired, studying for a test, and Dan Rather was a part of our test. And somebody was like, "Oh, Dan Rather cried," and I was like, "He cried." And like throughout the whole entire test, the only thing I could think about was that he cried. <laughs> I, I don't know. I answered that for one of the questions about him because it was like open ended, and I literally only put Dan rather cried. And then <laughs> she was just like, "What are you even talking about?" <laughs> and then, that's so crazy that you like met him and like talked to him. Like I got to tell all my friends though. <laughs> uh, well, he's never cried with me. Undead. <laughs> <laughs> right. Taking questions uh, from the audience. So Karen said, uh, what is the hardest, most difficult session you've ever had and why? And how would you handle it differently in hindsight? That's a really good question. Hi, Karen. <laughs> um, Karen is one of the people I would consider a mentor. You know, like I've known her for a long time and I've gone to her with problems and questions and she's always supported me, which is wonderful and amazing. Um, okay, hardest, most difficult session. I've had a couple um, the two that stand out, there was one I vividly remember being at my parents' house. I was probably 18 or 19 years old. Mm -hmm. They knew, knew, and I got a call from someone, and it was a famous actor. He said, hey, I have to do ADR. I know, I hear you You do ADR. Can you do ADR tomorrow? It's like, no, I, I, need, I need more lead time. I need prep time. I need these materials that I don't have. I, I don't think so. And he said, well, you know, if... I have somebody flying here with the tape of our movie and we have to do ADR. Can you do it? And, and for some reason I agreed to do it. And somebody flew in from LA with video of whatever movie this was. And ultimately the video was protected and I couldn't 
put it in my machine. And then he needed a special kind of TV to show him the lines that we did not have. And he didn't know to ask me these tech questions. Anyway, he ended up screaming at me in the middle of the session and it was just absolutely terrible. So in hindsight, I wish that I just said, I'm sorry, that would be setting myself up for failure or mm. maybe ask more questions, but I think I should have just said no. And instead mm. I jumped in, we got the work done. Uh, and he actually came back years later for other work. So clearly he forgot, but <laughs> being yelled at in, and uh, in a professional space mm. when you, you know, that's just not good. That doesn't feel good. Um, the other one was a radio job and the creatives had one vision and the clients had a different vision and the creatives were going after, after what they wanted. And we'd call the client and the client would say, well, no, I want it to sound like this. And it was just back and forth and back and forth. And we went till almost midnight okay. and people started yelling and I need to get home to my kid. How dare you? This is taking away from my life and people screaming and, um, and ultimately I think everyone just got too tired and agreed to go ahead with the commercial that we finally ended up with. But that was, it, that was really rough. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, again, same thing. I wish that I'd been more clear with my own boundaries and been able to say, Hey guys, um, we are approaching nine o'clock, which is my personal cutoff time. So whatever we don't get finished by nine o'clock, I'm happy to reschedule you for later in the week to finish. Um, and I think if I'd done that, it would have been a service to everyone in the room because tensions were running high. One of the people was pregnant and she started crying. Like it was a very dramatic session. Like oh, no. for a commercial, come on guys. It's just a commercial. <laughs> no, I, I can, I can't deal with people yelling at me in general. So in a professional space, I, I don't even know how I would handle it. Yeah. That's, it's, I, it's rough. It's rough. For sure. I definitely feel that. I actually have a question for you. Um, yeah, what does the education sphere look like um, in post-production? Because like in this new world of people learning online and and getting certificates through online programs, do most of the people you work with have a college uh, education in audio or is it just more how good you are is how competent you are? It depends on how old they are. So when I work with the old guard, with people who've been sound supervisors on movies for years and years, they maybe they don't even have degrees at all, but certainly not in audio post or audio production in, at all. Um, the young people, so people who come to me looking for work, they all have degrees in sound. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking through. I think that's right. So it is a relatively new degree, I think, like last 10 years maybe. Mm -hmm. So younger people will have degrees in this. There have been special schools, like there's a place in Florida called Full Sail, and they do all audio school. So you get a degree in audio engineering from them. But that doesn't mean that you know what to do in a studio. So to me, it's the portfolio and the experience that really means more. But a good way to get there is to go to school for it. Okay, and I know you sort of have like the motivation um, or like, you know, sort of like the background of having like other like creative people around you um, sort of like show you the ropes or show you, um, introduce you to the industry. Uh, do you have any advice for like other future creatives who maybe don't have like the support that you did? Or, like parents were just like, oh, like this isn't gonna make you any money. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. So. I'm very introverted. I don't do any of the networking events. I know that they exist. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's a new organization in Austin that does, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. It's called OmniSound and they, they are doing sound classes. Now they've moved all online and mm -hmm. their, their focus is to get more women in sound. Mm -hmm. But that's a great, they, they hold networking events where you can just go and meet all sorts of women in sound doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. Volunteering if you can. Um, I think just asking around, sending emails. If if I got, I've had a couple of people send me notes in LinkedIn, just asking kind of these sorts of questions. Like, 
know, what would you recommend? Or, Hey, I just did this mix. Would you mind listening to it? That mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I'm, I respond to that. I, I really do feel like it's important for people of my generation to look to the next generation and help them and to, to you know, give them the hand that mm -hmm. we had or didn't have whatever, whatever that was. Um, so yeah, I'd say just look around and see the people who are in your field doing what you want to do and reach out to them. Okay. And they keep reaching out to them <laughs> when they don't reply. Consistency is key. I mean, how do you determine like what to like charge people? Hmm. So every year or two, someone who works with me will call a couple the, the other few studios in town that do what we do and just make sure our pricing is is pretty comparable. Um, we have a rate sheet that hasn't changed much, hasn't changed for a few years. And it's, it's just the starting point. And if somebody comes in and says, Hey, we can't meet, you, you know, we can't meet your price sheet. That's way out of our budget, but we have this project. That's pretty cool. What do you think? Well, as long as we have studio time, then we will absolutely be flexible with the pricing. Mm -hmm. it, and it's hard because sometimes there are amazing projects that would be pro bono, you know, just, they don't have a budget, but they really, need and want good sound and I would love to work on it but I have to look at time and my staff's time and so usually that's not a large project is impossible but if I can give an hour here or there to make a project better we'll do that for free that's, okay. that's super awesome I mean what about like students who are like just starting off and they're sort of doing like a freelance thing you know like how do they determine you know like whether to like charge or to do stuff for free. I mean, if, if you're trying, I think you have to weigh the product and the value of the product in your portfolio or the project, um, with how much time it'll be. I think charging something is, is important. I found that if I do a big project and it's just, I really believe in this cause, let's do it together. I'm dry, it's hours and hours and hours and it's inefficient. Whereas if I say, okay, here's what I can give and here's the minimum I need to take home, mm -hmm. there seems to be a more respectful process, I guess, from that point. Mm -hmm. So I think you should value your work, value what you bring. And then if it's a project that will enhance your portfolio and your experience, then it's it's maybe worth it to drop your price to to make it within, you know, within their budget. Mm-hmm. But it's it's gray. I, I think it's a gray area. For sure. And how do you like market yourself um, for like different like clients? Like especially like when people like don't have like large portfolios or they're just starting off. So all of my marketing is word of mouth. And mm. it really is just I've been doing this for so long that I think people know to come to me and also friends who are in this space, if they can't do the job for some reason, they'll, they'll refer people to me. So it's referral and word of mouth. Um, so how to find those people again, just if it's TV, get involved with um, like Austin film society. I know does a lot of projects. UT has some great programs with people doing film TV, you know, small shorts, feature length, whatever film products, projects. So I think just getting in touch with them, offering your services, being as professional as possible, having a website that shows that you're competent and together and you you can do a slick job. For sure. Yeah. But, uh, and then we have another question that says, uh, where do you recommend posting your voice acting room? That's a great question. So I have clients who use a website called Voices123. I think there are thousands and thousands of people there with reels mm. um, and same thing. There are little, little pockets in Austin who meet, have meetups, they work together, they keep each other's reels. And then when someone has a casting call for something, then they send it out and, you know, it's a network that reinforces itself. They, they help each other out. So I would recommend finding those groups, the groups of voiceover people. Um, I think it's called Lone Star, Lone Star Voices or 
something like that in Austin. And it's a group of wonderful voiceover talent and they have meetups and they have classes and they keep a database of all of their, their um, VO reels. So mm-hmm. something like that would be a good place to start. Yeah, for sure. Okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And just to wrap up, can you sort of tell us about, you know, any plans that you have for the future, any personal or professional goals uh, that you can let people know about? Um, I think professionally, I feel like I've been really lucky and I enjoy my work very much. I enjoy nurturing the group, my team, the group of people who are there doing this work. Mm. And from here, you know, gr- growing the team out a little more, um, mm. getting more studio space so we can have many sessions going at the same time mm. professionally. I think that's where we're headed. And personally, I, I like being more involved with the community and less in pursuit of just money with the company and more in pursuit of, mm. you know, how do I provide more resources and network to mm. people who are where I was when I was in college, you know? So more community involvement. For sure, for sure. I definitely feel that. Yeah, it's important. You ain't never lie, it's very important. Very. Um, well, thank you for joining us in today's talk. Um, it was great talking to you, having a conversation. Um, you. you had a really, I mean, you had a lot of really good nuggets um, that I really enjoyed. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you Um, for having me. For sure. And if you guys want to hear more talks like this, uh, we have talks like these every Thursday at 1 p.m. We live stream off of E4U's Facebook and YouTube account. So you can check us out on both of those platforms. Um, The videos also stay up afterwards. So they'll always be there for you to go back and watch just in case you missed something or you want to remember something that was talked about here today. Um, But we can't wait. And I thank you so much for coming. And I'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Jalisha. All right.